Welcome back to Banging the Can, the Houston sports podcast that does not apologize for championship rings and tings, presented by Bolin Media. I am your host, Ross Bolin, back after game two, as promised, and your Houston Astros are still yet to lose a game in the postseason this year. 5-0, and up two games to none on the Yankees. We play our next three games, actually, Saturday, Sunday, Monday in New York. And the Yankees would need to beat the Astros four out of five games to pull off the comeback, which is, by my estimations and mathematical calculations and scientific projections, not going to fucking happen. Actually, we play every single day through next Wednesday. Holy shnikes. All right, so let's talk about game one and two a little bit before we move on to what's coming with game three. Verlander must have heard me talking shit after the Seattle series because he was absolutely nails. And I know I said some things about his postseason resume as well. Um, And as they were reviewing his postseason resume during game one of the ALCS, the commentators, I realized I may have been utilizing a bit of recency bias in evaluating his playoff performances. Verlander is one of the all-time great postseason pitchers all right just to be abundantly clear and he proved that again uh on Wednesday night I mean he was he was incredible there was a couple of moments uh, early on where it looked like maybe he was still in the same spot he was game one against Seattle where he didn't really have his best stuff and he was trying to find his feel on a couple of his pitches And as the commentators said, what the greats do is on the days they don't have their best stuff, they they're able to work it on the work it out on the mound in the middle of the game. So by the third or fourth inning, you saw, I mean, he was firing on all cylinders. Nobody was touching him at that point. It was exactly what when we discussed whether or not Dusty Baker should have pulled him in the fourth or fifth inning of game one against Seattle. This is the reason you give a guy like Verlander a little more rope, because Oftentimes, you give him two, three innings, maybe he looks shaky, and then it's nobody's touching the baseball the rest of the night. And that's the way it went with him game one against the Yankees. He was incredible. I mean, incredible. Just just couldn't, he couldn't have looked more confident on the mound, which is what you want to see in your pitchers, man. It, it obviously, which brings us to Framber Valdez, who, <laughs> who came out and was incredible, but... He had that one fielding, I mean, two airs, really, on the field that cost him. But if if not for that, we're talking about a shutout. The, like, as little as the it seems the Astros have done offensively, the Yankees have done nothing. Like, they are not scoring ever unless somebody hits a home run. I think 19 of their 21 postseason runs have come from homers or something crazy like that. Um, so Valdez did look shaky. He didn't exactly look as confident as I would have liked. But he pulled it back together. He sort of used that moment uh, and the error to seemingly motivate himself through the rest of the game and was, again, he was the dude he looked like all season long, the quality start king. He was was getting it done. And as a result, we've got two wins. And Bregman's still Bregman, it turns out. Look, the last two postseasons, it was really hard to watch Alex Bregman play baseball because you could tell something wasn't right. I couldn't tell if it was his health, if it was mental health, um, if it was him and his wife having kids, if, if what it was. And, and the more I've watched him in 2022 post-All-Star break, look, I think he was not healthy. I mean, it, it maybe, maybe it was both sides of the ball, mental and physical health. But certainly I don't think he was himself physically for a couple years there in the postseason. And I think he finally is feeling... Like cocky Breggs again, the guy we used to see back in the day who would step into the box every single time and small in stature as he may be, you knew that he knew he was getting on base and there was nothing you could do about it. It, it, That's cocky Breggs. And he was sort of one of the spiritual leaders of the team with Correa when he was that guy. And he's becoming that guy again at the exact moment we need him to because Correa is gone. And as I talked about before this series started... Correa was kind of our Yankee killer. We needed somebody else. Who was it going to be? And Bregman is definitely one of the guys that has stepped up. The other one obviously being the rookie shortstop, Jeremy Pena, who, with every passing game, looks more and more like a superstar. And when I say superstar, I mean 
performing at the level he is performing in the playoffs is something that only superstar baseball players do. That's where he's at as a rook. And I heard a story during, as you know, Carlos Correa has been doing a lot of the commentating on uh, post-game and pre-game on TBS with the crew. And I'll get to the commentators during the game in a moment. But Correa, they told a story that apparently before he left Houston, he went to Jeremy Pena and told him, hey, you're up next. It's your time. And you need to go take this thing and make it your team. And not only does that make me love Carlos Correa even more, it just reminds me what we have in this organization that's so special. And it's that they genuinely, these guys believe in each other and they care about each other and they're good people. We're drafting and putting together and trading for good people to be a part of what is like a family-esque organization brand. And, and yes, maybe there is some controversy wrapped up in that. I think the controversy of 2017 made that in-house family feeling even stronger. And I think you're seeing the result of that play out on the field in the 2022 postseason. And seeing what Bregman and Pena have done, stepping up when guys like Altuve and even Alvarez during these first two games have been struggling, I mean, enormous. You can't say enough about, I mean, Bregman, you expect it. That's what he's supposed to do. Pena is a rookie. It's incredible that he's already that type of player, that he's already got that kind of confidence and uh, is is it's not even it's not just confidence it's stability it's the it's the ability to walk into an enormous moment and not be shook by it to go and play under the lights against the fucking pinstripes and not let it get to you mentally and Pena is completely unfazed Jeremy Pena has been he looks like a fucking kid out there playing little league ball he's just having fun I mean you don't see the fear in his eyes at all. And there's guys you see the fear in their eyes. Some dudes use the fear. I think uh, our closer, Ryan Presley, is one of those guys. He feels that shit when he's out there. You see it in his eyes. But then he uses it, and it's like a fight. You fight or flight, it kicks in, and you utilize that shit, and all the adrenaline that comes with it, and you harness it, and you fuck. And that's what these dudes have been doing. Um, both both types of players. The Peñas, who we have on our team, who are... Who are Pretty, pretty light with it. They don't necessarily get, you know, the nerves the way that some other guys do. Like Presley. Uh, like Valdez. You know, like Framber. We've got both types of dudes. And they've both handled their shit correctly so far through two games. Or through five games, really, of the postseason. Altuve still being hitless is absolutely mind-blowing. Um, I don't really know what to make of it at this point. I mean, anyone you ask is going to tell you they're not worried about him, but but that's because you can't say you're worried about him. What do you? What do you he's going to see the interview and be pissed off. So when they ask Correa, like, are you worried about Altuve? And he's like, oh, no, I'm not worried about Jose. Jose's the best, blah, 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 blah. This happens. Well, it's not just that I agree with him. It's also that I know he's full of shit. I, we are all a little worried at this point. It's weird. It's it, Look, slumps happen. But he's our leadoff guy. He's the heart and soul of the offense. He's the beating heart of the offense. He's got to have his game together. And I said it before game one. I don't know if we can beat the Yankees without Jose Altuve. Now, I may have been wrong about that. It turns out we may not need him. But you want him around. I mean, the, the, these close games, man, they're stressful. 3-2 and shit. No, I don't want any of that. Let's, let's beat the fuck out of him in New York. Let's get Altuve going. If he starts hitting, the series is over. The series is over. If Jose Altuve starts hitting the baseball, the series is over. There is zero doubt that our pitching has the the gumption to get this done at this point. Zero doubt. Abreu, awesome. Presley, awesome. I mean, those two guys alone. Montero, a little shaky, but great all season, and I still trust him. We just have too many arms. And the offense is clicking, man. Alvarez is back on track. I mean, he didn't, it wasn't much time off, but <clears throat> he had a few at-bats there where I think the intentional walks had started to throw him off a little bit. Now he's back on track, seeing the baseball well. Maldonado has been awesome. Yuli, what the hell? Yuli Gurriel. It, look, literally, there are, okay, there are guys in the NBA, like Rajon Rondo, perfect example. He had so, several seasons where he was very mediocre during the regular season. Didn't even play that much some of the regular seasons. And then he would be playoff Rondo, right? He would transform in the postseason, go join up with LeBron or whatever, and be playoff Rondo. And it was a completely different guy who was one of the best players on the court every time he stepped onto the court. 
And Yuli, who did jack shit this season, really, after being the batting champion in 2021, at his age, I think he's 38, rough season, unbelievable five games of the playoffs so far. Probably the hottest hitter on our team, possibly. One of them, not in the home runway, but he's gotten a couple of those too. The dude is crushing the baseball. It's huge. And if these guys, if you don't see Yuli, Maldonado, if you don't see Pena stepping up, man, we're in a bad place. We're looking like the Yankees, where nobody's coming through. You can't get any runs. You got no offensive fucking rhythm. You're just, you're just hoping for the long ball. So thank God. Thank God. I mean, this is, look, we've had years in the postseason where things didn't go our way necessarily, where we, where we didn't make the World Series or we didn't win the World Series. And a lot of the times it's because you saw guys fall into a little slump and then other dudes not pick them up. And that's where this team has seemed to be different all season long, this Astros team. There's always someone, like I said earlier in the week, Always someone stepping up, always someone else filling the gap, making sure that, you know, the line stays taut, that somebody else picks up the slack. And it's impressive. And it's a lot of fun to watch. A lot of fun to watch. Last thing about game three. I've watched a lot of baseball. I, 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 over the years, I've had beefs with commentators on and off. There have been guys I was like, what's your deal? You're obviously biased. Joe Buck at one point, I really hated him. I get it now. Look, I, the game is the game. And let me explain something to you. New York is an enormous place with a bajillion people in it. All right. And the Yankees are one of the biggest sports brands on earth. So when they're doing the commentating, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of Yankees fans watching. Now, the Astros fans, we're all happy, Right. We're tuned in. We're loving it. We're winning. We don't give a fuck what the commentators are saying. They need to say something to keep these Yankees fans happy and tuned in. So they keep saying this, the only one swing away. Ooh, remember the last time this slapdick was in the box and he had two strikes? He hit a home run. Like, they kept saying stuff, rooting the Yankees to a comeback. And, and then as it kept not materializing, they got more and more disappointed. One of them in particular, and I couldn't put, put my finger on which one it was. And I don't even care. But the point is this, if you're an Astros fan and you're watching and you're getting upset, you're taking this the wrong way. This is the best possible thing that can happen in sports. Watching your team win while you have an audience avatar for all Yankees fans in the form of the commentators giving you the tears to drink, that's the stuff of life. That's the elixir of life. You drink those tears. This is a good thing for us. You listen and you laugh. You laugh. At the commentators, you mock them. That's the that's fun. This is fun. We're having fun again. And it feels good. Fuck the commentators. Who cares what they say? Turn it, mute it, and listen to the radio. I, I had a lot of people tweeting at me. I watch it on mute. I listen to the local broadcast and watch the game. That's genius. But I, I still think you're missing out on something special. There's nothing, nothing that I have experienced in sports quite like watching the Astros beat the Yankees while the commentators cry. And the amount of crying happening in the Yankees camp right now is astounding. Boone, he said the roof killed them. They lost to the roof, the retractable roof that we don't even ever fucking open. You know when we open it? When Rob Manfred makes us. That's when they open the roof. Correa said he's played, played there six years. He thinks he played with the roof open six times. It's not a common thing. We didn't pick the roof. Do you understand? Do, all these Yankees players bitching. Well, look how fast uh, Judge hit his ball 102 miles an hour and Bregman hit his ball 95 miles an hour, but Bregman's went out of the stadium so they scored a run and Judges didn't, so we didn't score. You're describing the rules of baseball. The sport of baseball. Nothing unfair occurred. Our guy hit the ball out of the field of play, scoring three runs. Your guy hit the ball six inches short, causing an out. That's how sports work. Oh, the wind was blowing a little harder. Maybe God isn't a fan of you. I don't know what happened, but you fucking lost, and there's not some like weird excuse you can pull out now to make it right. You just got outplayed. You didn't produce enough runs. And your pitcher made one devastating error that cost you the ball game and one swing of the bat from Alex Bregman. That's what happened. Going out and saying otherwise is fucking weird. It's not even, I don't even want to call it like pussy shit. It's just bizarre behavior 
almost delusional in a way. And you know what it is? It's the fucking entitlement that makes Yankees fans so disgusting to me. And just just terrible to talk with about sports. You're not owed a home run. Just because you've got the American League home run king on your team doesn't mean you automatically fucking are owed them. He still has to go hit them. If it doesn't leave the field of play and it's caught, it's a fucking out. That's how baseball works. What were you implying? What what even was the... The roof beat you? It was open when we were batting too. Everybody was under the same fucking circumstances and settings. It's crazy. Crazy town to get on national TV with all these cameras pointed at you and be like... You know what? I'm pretty confident. I'm just going to come out and say it. I think the roof beat us. What are you, what are you, how, you, who would have guessed it? What a fucking idiot. How, you know your fans are going to be on your ass and our fans are going to be on your ass. Just inviting the roast. Maybe he wanted the attention drawn off of him from the players. But then his players started doing interviews and talking about the distance and exit velocity and fucking launch angle. What the hell? What are you people doing a science project? It's fuck sports. It's sports. When did all you meathead jackasses turn into Bill Nye the fucking science guy? The exit velocity? It's either a home run or it's fucking not. That's how home runs work. What the fuck is wrong with you? This isn't the NFL with catch, no catch. We don't have to worry about that. It's quite simple. Does the fucking ball leave the fucking field of play? That's a home run. If it stays in and it's caught, you're out. Nobody gives a shit after that. If Aaron Judge's ball had hit a fucking bird flying through the sky, causing it to drop into Kyle Tucker's glove, that would be a completely different set of circumstances in which I would completely understand the complaining and the bitching and the moaning. But that didn't fucking happen. It didn't fucking happen. He hit a fucking pop-up and it is a short fucking field and right. If you don't hit it out, it's on you. We made the fence short. The whole park is a fucking hitter's ballpark. You've got me so upset that I'm freaking out my dogs in the room with me right now. Who the fuck blames a loss in the postseason on a roof? I just... uh, Man, I'm glad that's not us. I'm glad that's not our... That's not us having to go out there and say shit like that. Because it's... It's a gift. I need, I need to take my own advice and learn how to love this because it's the best thing that could have possibly happened is them all crying the way they're crying. It's unbelievable. They're doing, it's somehow worse than Dodgers fans getting exiting the postseason early and then being so upset and entitled that they think the postseason rules should change to accommodate them. This is somehow even sillier. You're still in it and you're blaming L's on a roof. And, and implying that like some type of mystical magic may have been against you because your guy hit the ball harder, but it didn't go as far. And then you got the commentators in the post game. Instead of talking about the game, I've got people texting me, what the fuck is wrong with these guys? They're still talking about launch angle. They're still talking about math. And the reason, I, I obviously have a lot of uh, feelings about this, as you can tell. I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Barely slept last night because I was so upset. Just what, like trying to wrap my head around why this would be what they wasted their time on. They don't care about us. That's the reason. They don't care about the Astros fans. They're appealing to the larger, broader audience. And in this case, it's Yankees fans. And with them down 2-0, it's definitely Yankees fans. So just let it be. Don't get too upset. Don't let it, don't let it, you know, don't let it mess with you too much. It is what it is. Us against the world. Houston versus everyone. Fuck them all. Suck our dicks kiss the ring on our resident sports book mybookie.com the Astros are currently plus 122 for game three in New York slight underdog with LMJ on the bump the over under is again seven and I will keep taking the over until it hits I don't care guess what today's episode is brought to you by mybookie the sports book every can banger should be using to stack cash during this Astros postseason run the Rockets regular season as well and the Texans too get all your sports betting done at mybookie use code Ross when you sign up and double your deposit bonus up to $1,000. That means if you say, let's say you put in $500 and you use code Ross on MyBookie when you deposit. 
MyBookie will match that $500 with another $500. So you'll have $1,000 in your account to throw in the Astros for games three and four. I'm assuming that's all we'll need. Also this weekend, tonight even, Charles Oliveira, Islam Makakev. Uh, they highlight the main event, UFC 280, could be the biggest pay-per-view event of the year. you got Sterling, Dillashaw, Jan, O'Malley, and whether you're a diehard UFC or a casual fan like me, every punch that lands could be another win at my bookie. You can predict individual matchups, bet on fights to go the distance, or lock in prop bets like X-Fighter to score a knockout, all for a chance at a bigger payout. And for a limited time only, join the MyBookie family and you will double your first deposit instantly. Just use promo code ROSS, R-O-S-S, on sign up to claim your bonus. Act fast because this is the last time you'll be able to grab this deposit bonus. My bookie, Code Ross. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with my bookie. So we play again Saturday at 4.07 p.m. Central Time. We get this weird, it's like 6 o'clock in New York or whatever, 5 o'clock in New York, 4 o'clock our time. 4.07 Saturday. Lance McCullers Jr. pitching for the Astros. Garrett Cole pitching for the Yankees. How sweet it would be to light up Garrett Cole. I don't know about you, but as soon as he exited the team, in fact, during his last interview as an Astro, when technically he wasn't an Astro anymore, and he let us know that by putting on a non-Astros hat, I had a feeling he might suck as a dude. He might not be my favorite ex-Astro. And the more I've watched him pitch, and the more I've seen his post-game pressers, I'm very anti-Garrett Cole. Garrett Cole and Garrett Cole. Fuck them both. Um, not a fan. Don't like the dude. Want to see him get lit up. He he doesn't look like he's having fun there. I don't know if it's just he's clean shaven and got clean cut hair now, but he looks like shit. And uh, I, I, I just don't see things going well for Garrett. I don't think he's got the stuff this year. I know his ERA is low. I know he had a good season. But uh, yeah, too much weird controversy with him. All the, the sticky tack shit and the... And again, it just, the amount of fucking rampant league-wide rule bending that has gone on in baseball since time immemorial, to quote myself, is, it's always been a part of the game, and the Yankees and their fans being uh, one of the fan bases that refused to take any responsibility as they were pointing the finger at the Astros since 2017 and spewing vitriol constantly, it makes me, it makes this whole experience, being up 2-0, seeing them struggle the way they are offensively, seeing the frustration, seeing the horrid post-game pressers from all their players and coaches, it makes it all the sweeter, all the more enjoyable. So soak it in, Astros fans. Remember, this is year six. Six in a row we've been to the ALCS, the American League Championship Series. That is a dynasty by some definition of the rule, by, by some definition of the word. That is a dynasty. You got to appreciate it. Because we don't know if this will ever happen again. And we don't know how many more years of this run we got. I'd say a good three, four, probably. Look, I won't lie to you. We could be good forever. The team is <laughs> just built in a way that we have our next young core already right there, ready to go. And that that's why the Astros are so deserving of our, of our emotional commitment as fans, I think. It's why I've given them my emotional commitment. Because they've shown me that they give a shit about the product they put on the field. And they've produced wins. Tons and tons of wins and made it really, really fun for us to watch baseball again in Houston. I love the Astros for that and always will. Um, and love all of you for listening. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for listening to the show, telling your friends and family about Banging the Can. Follow us on TikTok, on Instagram, on Twitter, at Banging the Can. Go to bowlinmedia.com slash shop to get yourself some merch. Tag us in all your social media. If you're going to the game, if you're going to be in New York, I want to see you at Banging the Can on Instagram and your stories on Twitter. Take photos, take videos, send them to us. I'll share them with everybody else, all the other can bangers. We appreciate you. Tell your friends and family about the show. Follow us everywhere. I'll be back next week. I'm Ross Bolin, and I'll be back after game four on Monday morning, most likely, because we play again Monday evening. If not Monday morning, I will definitely be back after game five. Because we do have the House of the Dragon season finale Sunday night, and I have to record our House of the Dragon podcast, Oysters, Clams, and Cockles, the number one House of the Dragon podcast in the realm, immediately afterwards. So I might be groggy Monday morning. But after game five, if not after game four, um, and again, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Until next time, go Astros. And as always, H-Town.
stay down.